This is Florida, a crazy but beautiful place. But if you look beyond the palms, there are many dark secrets being held there. Secrets that shocked law enforcement when they found out that they were committed by one of their own. Secrets that serial killer Gerard Schaefer took to the grave. Acts so heinous that they make people physically sick. The lives of unidentified young women brutally cut short. In this episode, we are looking at a letter from Gerard Schaefer. It's from 1990, so we get a glimpse into the older prison system. He talks about the use of the electric chair, his own ego as the world's number one serial killer, and he describes his friendship with Ted Bundy, along with John Wayne Gacy. There are truly shocking things said in this letter. But who was Gerard Schaefer? When he was just a young boy, he would steal women's underwear, fantasize about dying, and even tied himself to trees because it aroused him sexually. He admitted later in life that he also killed animals, hunting in the Everglades and shooting animals that couldn't be consumed. He met his first girlfriend, Cindy, when he was 14, and the two were in a relationship for three years. In spite of their unorthodox sex life, Gerard would make her take part in roleplay fantasies, in which he tore off her clothes and essayed her. The letter we are about to see belongs to Mark D. Took who has such a great collection and was kind enough to share this letter with us. He also has an Instagram account. I'll leave a link to that in the description, but I strongly recommend you go and give this account a follow. Thanks, Mark. In this letter, a woman's name is mentioned multiple times. I will be calling her Sarah to give her anonymity. Dear Mr. Nolt, my business representative, Sarah, sent me a letter you've asked her to forward to me. She's so busy that she rarely writes to me anymore, although I really can't blame her. There's not much to write about and life in prison is continuously boring and dreary. The only time we get any excitement is when we have executions. Then we see a lot of activity. Florida executes by electrocution, which is a form of burning to death. It smells a bit like barbecued pork, not too offensive when the victim is prepared properly. You probably know all about the preliminaries if you are writing to people on death row. Whoa, what a depraved existence you must have when your only excitement is watching someone get fried to death on the electric chair. What a way to open a letter. In 1967, Gerard earned an associate degree in business administration and on January 1968, enrolled in the Florida Atlantic University to get a teacher's license. After doing so, he briefly held down a teaching job at the Plantation High School, but was fired after only a few weeks because of, in the principal's words, totally inappropriate behavior. He also tried to become a Catholic priest, but was rejected. He married in 1968, but divorced after two years, his wife citing cruelty as reason. In 1971, he married again, this time to Teresa Dean, a secretary he met while working as a security guard. Schaefer eventually set his mind on becoming a police officer and did get a job as such, in spite of the fact he failed his psychological test when he applied. He was soon fired 
for using personal information about female traffic offenders to ask them out on dates. He then moved to Martin County and got another law enforcement job, eventually becoming Deputy Sheriff. My job in the prison is Deaf House Orderly, so I get to see and hear a lot. The best excitement this year was when the Black Widow murderess, Judy Buenonano, was warranted for execution, and we got to watch her shave her pussy for the chair. The captain let us watch through a viewing port. Good set of boobs on Judy too. Again, it's just so harrowing. Judy murdered her husband and son, and as she was preparing to die, there are other serial killers spying on her. It really shows how Schaefer was so dehumanized and had zero empathy. On July 21st, 1972, Schaefer picked up two hitchhikers, 17-year-old Pamela Wells and 18-year-old Nancy Trotter, on the highway near a local beach. He told them, falsely, that hitchhiking was illegal in Martin County, then drove them back to a halfway house where they were staying. Schaefer offered to meet them the next morning, off duty, and drive them to the beach himself. The girls agreed, but instead of taking them to the beach on July 22nd, Schaefer drove them to the swampy Hutchinson Island. There, he started making sexual remarks, then drew a gun and told the girls he planned to sell them as white slaves to a foreign prostitution syndicate. Or if they were lucky, he would just SA and murder them. Forcing them out of the car, he bound both the girls and left them balanced on tree roots, with nooses around their necks, at risk of hanging themselves if they slipped and fell. Schaefer would run a knife across their body and ask them which one wanted to die first. He enjoyed asking this question because he said, you would soon see two best friends turn into worst enemies as neither of them wanted to die. Schaefer received a phone call and it was an emergency. Schaefer left them, promising to return shortly. But the girls escaped in his absence and reached the highway where they flagged down a passing police car. They had no problem identifying their assailant since Schaefer had told them his name. By that time, Schaefer had discovered their escape and telephoned Sheriff Richard Crowder. I've done something foolish, Schaefer told his boss. You're going to be mad at me. He had overdone his job, Schaefer said, trying to scare the girls out of hitchhiking in the future for their own good. Charged with false imprisonment and two counts of aggravated assault. Schaefer was released on $15,000 bond. I was assigned to do that lousy job because I was considered at one time to be the number one serial killer in the world. In 1973, I had 34 confirmed victims, according to the media. The police tried to take the tally up to 200 by counting victims in Canada, England, West Europe and North Africa. The media stuck me with fancy names. The Sex Beast, The Butcher of Blind Creek, De Henker in Europe. Junk like that. They finally decided on about 180. Sarah and I have been trying to come up with an accurate list of victims. Norris, serial killers. Only give me credit for the 26 victims from Oakland Park. It's a real mess. I don't understand how he's so far apart in his own estimations. Surely he knows if he's killed 26 or 200. I can't comprehend killing somebody, but I do understand that if you do anything enough, you will become desensitized to it. So maybe he could be 20 or 30 out, but I think he likes having the number 200 banded around with his name. I mean, look at how he says, 
only gives me credit for 26 victims. Credit, like it's something to be proud of. He made a plea bargain and was sentenced to a year in prison with the possibility of being released after six months. Two months after posting bail, he abducted two more female hitchhikers, Susan Place and Georgia Jessup. He killed them the same way he intended to kill Wells and Trotter and buried their bodies. When the remains were found, Schaefer was in prison. The similarities between their murder and Schaefer's attempted murder were enough to secure a warrant for his mother's house, where he and his mother lived. Inside, they found a mountain of evidence implicating Schaefer in the disappearances of over 30 women in the area over the years, such as jewelry, clothing, diaries, a driver's license, a passport, and some teeth. He had half-baked explanations for all of it. The media is always ranting on about Ted Bundy, Henry Lucas, and John Wayne Gacy. At the end, Ted was nothing. He had a lousy 40 women on his sheet. Henry Lucas's partner, Otis Tool, he was my fuck boy here. So I know all of Henry's secrets. Gatesy got what? 33 boys? That's hardly top-notch serial killing, is it? Have you ever heard such disregard for human life? Schaefer also sounds a little jealous to me. I mean, if you excuse what he's actually referring to, he sounds like he's belittling these other serial killers. The ones the media took more of a shine to. Everyone he mentions is a heavy hitter. The list of suspected victims would grow over time, but Schaefer faced charges in only two murders. He was indicted on May 18th, 1973, for the slayings of Jessup and Place. Held without bond pending trial, he was convicted on two counts of first degree murder in October 1973 drawing concurrent terms of life imprisonment. Numerous appeals, some 20 in all, were uniformly rejected by various state and federal courts. Schaefer was nearly forgotten by 1990, when a former high school friend published a collection of his stories under the title Killer Fiction. More volumes followed, Schaefer insisting that his stories were art. Police and prosecutors described them as thinly veiled descriptions of actual crimes. In private letters to attorneys and acquaintances, Schaefer admitted as much himself. Witness his reference to a story titled Murder Demons. What do you think Murder Demons is? You want confessions, but you don't recognize them when I anoint you with them. And we've just gotten started. Other correspondents swiftly raised the body count. I'm not claiming a huge number. I would say it runs between 80 and 110. But over eight years and three continents, one whore drowned in her own vomit while watching me disembowel her girlfriend. I'm not sure that counts as a valid kill. Did the pregnant ones count as two kills? It can get confusing. Again, wow. So he wrote this number of kills eight months after the letter we are looking at. And I can't say I think it's lies either, as there is so much evidence linking him to other murders. And his MO is sickeningly confident. You can tell that he's refined it for years. Gatesy is on death row. How will he go out? Bundy went out screaming and squealing like a woman. You should have heard him howl when they were pushing the cotton up his backside. He squealed like a pig when his penis was tied off. And to top it off, the captain made him wear a rubber diaper that Andrea Jackson was to have worn to the chair, but didn't because she got a federal stay. When the media saw Ted, they reported that he looked sort of unsteady. He was. He had a box of cotton up his arse. The captain told Ted 
that if he shot off his mouth to the press, that he'd have the executioner put him on a slow burn cycle. I've never heard of inmates having their penis tied off or cotton inserted into their anus. I'm assuming this is for loss of bowel control. Also, to think of Bundy squealing at the thought of what was happening to him is a small token of justice to the pain inflicted on his victims. Though he was under close watch, Schaefer still managed to run a mail fraud scheme from his cell having associates post ads in sex magazines and sending letters to people who replied, always using a female pseudonym. In some correspondence, he pretended to be a 14-year-old girl who offered to send paying customers nude photos of herself. He also enjoyed sending convicts in other prisons letters, pretending to be a woman, pursuing romantic relationships with them and acted as jailhouse lawyer, using the information he gained from convicts to sell them out to authorities, even getting a murderer sent to death row. Women are executed using a lower voltage than men. Run a man for three minutes on 3800 volts and his intestines will start coiling out of his anus. A woman run over the same cycle will pass her guts. The vaginal wall splits and it's very messy. So they give her an initial pop of 2800 volts, then cook her at 1800 over three minutes. It's interesting in a scientific way, but Ted was a loser in the end. And I thought it was a nice touch that a lady executioner pulled the switch on him. It's crazy to think that in prison, Schaefer and Bundy would have been passing six stories to one another. I actually have some of these conversations written by Schaefer in a different letter. He summarizes their relationship as well. He told me that he put the seat of the VW bug as far forward as possible. So the women's knees were jammed up under the dash. A large woman was so cramped she couldn't move, but this one gal was on the small side, and as soon as he yanked the cord, she popped up and was half over the back seat. Her legs weren't tied, and she was kicking so hard, Ted thought she was gonna kick out the windscreen. After that, he tied the ankles, pushed the seat fully forward, then got in the back seat and got down to business. These poor women, and the nightmares they went through. It makes it all the more real, hearing these two reflect on it like that. Ted told me that he could fuck a corpse for a week if he kept it at a higher, cool elevation in the summer. He had body dumps in Washington and Colorado and Utah. I admit, I encouraged him to tell me all about it, and based on my findings, I felt he was telling the truth. Unfortunately, I only had maybe 12 hours of conversation with Ted the whole time he was at FSP. He was simply trying to impress me with his various kills. I paid attention because it was fascinating to me what he had to say. I think a lot of people were fascinated by what he said and I'm sure that the police are not revealing what all he told them. I think that might be one of the worst things I've ever read. I knew that Bundy was a necrophile, but I did not realize he went so far to keep the bodies fresh. It's so disturbing. Near the end, he was opening up with a lot of details about what he was doing with the corpses. He'd pretty them up with fresh makeup before the ghouling began. Stuff like that. I could tell you plenty of gross details, but they are pretty sickening but then maybe that would make for a nice interview. So there you go, from one serial killer to another, probably one of the most harrowing conversations to have ever taken place. You can only imagine the stories that Schaefer was saying back to him to make Bundy feel comfortable to say this. Schaefer's luck ran out on December 3rd, 1995, when another inmate barged into his cell. 
slashed Schaefer's throat and stabbed him in both eyes. Prison officials named the killer as inmate Vincent Riviera, who was serving life plus 20 years for two murders in Tampa. No specific motive was given, but it is understood that Schaefer's reputation as a rat and troublemaker is what eventually caught up with him. My thoughts are with all the victims, who for the most part will never be named. To Gerard Schaefer, good riddance. Until next time, stay sane.